as we read the Word of God, Romans chapter 6. As we've been going through these lessons, uh, of course in the, in the teens, we're teaching the same series, the adults are getting down here in Sunday school, uh, changed into his image. And so as we go through this, man, the Lord has been showing me some things, working on me. Uh, I need to grow. There's no, there's, no, there's no stage in our Christian life where we finally get to where we've got it all. Paul said, yeah. Paul's probably the greatest Christian to ever have lived, and he said, I've not apprehended, meaning I haven't arrived. I hadn't figured it all out. And so there's no level we'll ever get to where we can finally sit back and say, you know what, I finally reached the peak of Christianity. I've got it down. We'll never get there. So we all need to be changed. But God has shown me some things, and I'm excited about this. Uh, some of this may be what we've heard here recently. Uh, but God gave me something just this week in Romans chapter 6, working on Sunday school. And so we're going to preach, we're going to begin reading verse number 11. Uh, the Bible says this, Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lusts thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. We're going to focus on those four verses. We may pull a few things out of the rest of this chapter, uh, but I want to preach on this thought tonight, dead and alive. Amen. Dead and alive. And alive. In the Old West, if you ever watched any of those movies, they had those wanted posters that they'd hang on the outside of the, the, the sheriff's office in different places around town. And, and it would have somebody's picture on it. And what would it say? Wanted, dead, or alive. I'm going to preach tonight on dead and alive. I think if we can imagine it this way, maybe God's got your picture and he says wanted. I want you dead and alive. And we're going to explain that tonight and show how that, that is what the Christian life really kind of boils all down to. Maybe you're struggling with something specific. Maybe you've got some, some sin, some struggle in your life that you think, I just can't beat this thing. I can't seem to get over it. We'll talk about that. And this idea of dead and alive, I think, is going to help us tonight. So let's pray. We'll have another song, and then we'll get into the message. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for speaking to us. Lord, I thank you for the Word of God and how it meets us right where we live. And God gives us exactly what we need. I pray that you'd fill us with your spirit tonight as we preach. Uh, God, I by no means uh, have figured out Christianity. I have discovered, Lord, the longer I'm saved, the more I need. Uh, the, Lord, the more I need you, the more I need to grow. And so I've got plenty of, uh, of problems. But God, the, the Bible is perfect. The Bible knows what we need. And so, Lord, I pray that you would help me tonight to preach what you've given. God, help me not to get in the way at all. Yeah. And I pray that somebody might be helped tonight through what's preached. If there's somebody here that's not saved, Lord, I pray that tonight might be the night that they enter into that relationship with you, the greatest relationship any of us could ever have. Yeah. Lord, as you are, with you as our Savior, bless the service, bless the song. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. God doesn't think like me His thoughts and His ways are too high for me to see I'll just choose to trust Him in everything Cause God doesn't think like me if I had my way, if my dreams came true, life would be great for everyone I knew. No worries, no problems, no burdens or care. And knowing he is near. But then that's problematic if I try to make it real. This world is not my home, no matter how permanent it feels. The worries and problems are exactly what I need to help me keep my focus on where it needs to be. 
So I'll set my mind on things above, not on things here below. My faith is firmly planted in the one who is my hope. And I'll seek first his kingdom and let my kingdom die and be transformed by renewing my mind. So I'll set my mind on things above, not on things here below. My faith is firmly planted in the one who is my hope. And I'll seek first his kingdom and let my kingdom die and be transformed by renewing my mind. God doesn't think like me. His thoughts and His ways are too high for me to see. So I'll just choose to trust Him in everything. Cause God doesn't think like me. God doesn't think like me I'm glad God doesn't think like me amen I'd probably get myself in a whole lot of problems I'd probably be in a whole lot more problems if me and God thought alike but I'm glad he his ways are higher than my ways his thoughts are higher than my thoughts dead and alive if you're like me you find that there are some specific things in your life that you just can't seem to get over the hump on. You just can't seem to get the victory over. And we've preached on on a thought like this before. Uh, and of course, really, as in the Christian life, there's always going to be struggles. There's always going to be something that we just are struggling with. That's the nature of the flesh, right? We we live in this sinful flesh. And when I got saved, my spirit got saved, but my flesh did not get saved. My, the, the Bible says the soul, which is the mind, the preachers taught us this, the mind, the emotions, and the will. That is being sanctified daily. And sanctified being, means it's being changed. It has to be changed every day. A little bit changes in that thing. And so it's becoming more like Christ. I plugged Sunday school while we're here. Uh, make sure you're, you're here for Sunday school. Being changed into His image is what we're teaching through. And that's where we get this message tonight. Uh, but there's always going to be something we struggle with. But listen, if you're struggling with some of the same things that you've struggled with for years, there's a little bit of a problem there. If maybe you're struggling with something that you've struggled with since before you got saved, there's a problem there. All right, And so I want to help you tonight with that. I believe this will help us. Scripture tells us what this idea of dead and alive means. Now, the first ten verses here in Romans chapter 6 talk about spiritually being dead. Let's go back up to verse number 1 and look at it. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Now, really, I challenge you to go home and read Romans chapter 5, 6, 7, and even 8 because they all tie together. All right? But we're talking about grace here in verse number 1. Paul says, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Basically what he's saying is, is because God's grace is good and God's grace covers sin, does that just give us a license to sin? Should we just continue? Keep, keep sinning? Should we just continue to live that kind of life? No. Look at verse number 2. He says it this way. God forbid. How shall we, here it is, that are, what? Dead to sin, live any longer therein. Now, if I'm supposed to be dead to sin, then why do I keep struggling? Why do I keep struggling with sin? Why do I keep struggling with some of the same sins that I've always struggled with? It's because I'm not dead to sin. We'll explain it. All right, verse number three. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. It's talking about salvation there, not baptism. Baptism, let me clarify this, baptism does not save you. Nothing special about the water that goes in this tank. 
It's purified Delaware River is all that is. And it doesn't wash away anybody's sin. All right? Baptism doesn't save you. Salvation. But what happens is when we get saved, God's blood covers our life. When we get in that baptistry tank, all we're doing is a, it's a picture. It's showing everybody that, I, hey, I'm crucifying the old man, that old sinful man. Behold, all things are become new, it says in Corinthians. I'm crucifying that old man. I'm being buried under the water just like Jesus was buried for three days. And I'm raised to walk in newness of life. And so he's saying here, when we're baptized, we're baptized into Christ's death. Now, he only had to die one time. Yeah. That means this, I only have to get saved one time. If I, if I had to get saved over and over and over again, then Jesus would have to die over and over and over and over again. Does that make sense? But he only had to die one time. So I only have to get saved once. So I don't want you to be confused about that. And I don't think we are. But verse number four, therefore we're buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk, here it is, in newness of life. Now we're going to, not going to take the time to read the rest of those verses, but look at verse number 14. Look at verse number 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. For sin shall not have dominion over you. Here's what the word dominion means. It means to rule. It means the power of governing and controlling. It means the power to direct, rule, and use. So Paul says there in verse 14, sin shall not have that power to control. Sin shall not have that power to govern. Sin shall not have that power to use you. It shall not have that dominion over you. All right, does that make sense? Now, how many of you honestly here tonight have ever felt like sin has dominated you? Yeah. Sure. We've all probably been in a place like that where we thought, I, I can't beat this one thing. This is kind of cool standing out here like this. Thanks, Brother Tony. Brother Tony did a great job on this. Brother Ito painted this thing. Looks great. Pastor will be excited about it when he gets back. Back to the preaching. We've all had a sin at some point in our life, maybe even right now, that you just can't seem to beat. And you feel like it's beating you. Man, you come to the altar, every church service, God, help me get victory over this. Lord, I don't want to do this. I'm tired, of, I'm tired of confessing this same sin over and over and over again. And, and genuinely, in your heart, you mean it. We come forward and think, God, I don't want to do this anymore. Please help me, give me victory. And we get up and we feel a little better. And we go home and we blow it. And we sit at home and we think, God, what happened? Did, did you not listen to my prayer? Were you, were you not listening to me, God? I, I need your strength. I admit it. I can't do this. And so then we come to grips with, uh, God's not at fault. I'm at fault. And so we pray at home again. I'm, I'm telling you what I've done. Right? God, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Lord, it's my pride that I get caught up thinking that it's your fault, that you weren't listening. I know you always listen. I go through all of this in my mind and I pray again. And the next day, you know what happens? I do the same dumb thing. Then I go through the same dumb confession. And I go through the same dumb scenario. And I get frustrated. All right, you listen? I get frustrated thinking, why can't I beat this? Part of the problem is, why can't I beat this? I can't beat it, can I, Brother Eustace? I don't have the strength. I don't have the power. I don't have the ability. But I do have the one that does. The problem is we're not using what he's given us. And that's all of us, myself included. And so he says, sin shall not have that dominion over us. But sometimes we feel like we're being dominated by whatever that sin is. Now think about this. The phrase there in verse number 14, shall not have. Everybody pay attention. I'm not going to be very long tonight, I don't think. So we're going to run through this and get right to the point of the message and then go home. The phrase shall not have is a phrase of advice suggestion or even permission it implies choice here's what i mean look at verse number 12 let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that ye should obey it in the lust thereof would you agree with me tonight sin is a choice I can't control the temptations necessarily. Some of them maybe I, I, can't con I might be able to control a scenario. But I can't necessarily control every temptation that comes my way. But temptation is not sin. Temptation is a choice. 
temptation comes my way, and then I have to choose. I'm either going to give in to the temptation, or I'm going to avoid the temptation. I'm going to do what I'm being tempted to do and obey it in the lust thereof, like it said in verse 12, or I'm not going to give in and take the way of escape, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. And so temptation itself is not the sin giving into it. It's a choice. And so when he says there, sin shall not have dominion, it's almost a permissive kind of a term. It's, an, uh, it's, a, it's, it's your choice. God is not saying right there that once you get saved, you'll never struggle with sin again. What God is saying is once you get saved, you now have the power of God in your life to say no. We just learned uh, this last week in Sunday school that I'm not a slave to sin anymore. I'm not in bondage to sin anymore. Before you got saved, you had no choice but to sin. You had no choice. It's who you were. Your spiritual father was the devil. He's the father of lies. He's the father of deception. He's the father of wickedness and unholiness. That's all he's about. And so as his child, that's who we were. But once I got saved, I no longer have to give in to that. I no longer have to sin. I'm not in bondage to it anymore. And so God is not saying, once you get saved, you'll never struggle with sin again. But he is saying, once you get saved, you don't have to give in to it. It shall not. It doesn't have to have control over you. It doesn't have to be allowed in your life. But obviously, we still struggle. Listen, it's one thing to know that I don't have to give in to sin, but tomorrow, we're probably going to go sin. Some of the things we're struggling with, and, and as I just described that scenario of coming to the altar, you're thinking, man, I'm going to get right with God tonight, but in the back of your mind, you're thinking, I'm probably going to blow it again tomorrow. You ever been there? Come to the altar, pray, ask God to forgive you, and in the back of your mind you're thinking, I don't think it's going to work. I don't think it's going to work. Now that's a whole other idea of, of lack of faith and all that, but we'll, let's stick to the message here tonight. Look at Galatians chapter 5, verse number 16. I'll just give you another Bible. We're coming back to Romans. But to illustrate this idea of it doesn't have to dominate you. Sin shall not have dominion. Galatians chapter 5 verse number 16. Paul writing here again says, this I say then, walk in the spirit, and here's our phrase, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. But how many of you fulfill the lust of the flesh from time to time? Sure. Somebody cuts you off in traffic, what do you do? Come on now, let's be real. <laughs> Somebody butts in line at the grocery store. What are you? Gonna, I was getting ready to walk to the to the uh, was it uh, was it Walmart or, or somewhere the other day, and I was heading to the line. And there weren't very. Of course, Walmart no, Walmart is notorious for having two hundred and fifty thousand checkouts and two cashiers. And they got they got five million people wandering around that store with a vest on, and none of them know how to count money. <laughs> oh no no, there's not my job. <laughs> I walked into a place one time, I said, I was a Burger King on a basketball trip. I said, listen, all I've got is out-of-state cash. Do you guys accept that? And the girl walked away. She goes, i got to go ask my manager. So I let her go. She goes back to the back. She goes back up front with this goofy smile on her face. She goes, you were kidding me, weren't you? I said, I sure was. I'll have a number three <laughs> with my out-of-state cash. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> you got to try that sometime. It's funny. They ring you up, and it's like $22.17, and you give them twenty-five seventeen, and they don't know what to do. But hang on. They flip the light, and everybody behind you gets ticked off, right? I need help. Anyway, there's a rant for you. I don't even know how I got off on all that. What am I talking about? Somebody help me. What am I talking about? The flesh, right? What what gets you in the flesh? All right, we walk, we fulfill the lust of the spirit. Why do we fulfill the lust of the flesh? Galatians five sixteen, because we're not walking in the spirit. Yeah. Same thing. You shall not. Paul said it. You shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. But sometimes I do fulfill the lust of the flesh, and it's in that verse where, because we're not walking in the spirit. 
Well, the same thing is true when you go back to Romans chapter 6. Why do we give in? Why do we, uh, why do we have those sins that dominate us? They, dem they have dominion over us because, look at verse number 13. First of all, we yield to those, thing those things. Verse number 13. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. So why do those things uh, dominate us? Why do we struggle with those things? Because we're yielding to them. When the temptation comes along, we're giving in. We're yielding. What does it mean to yield? Here's what yield means. It means to allow. It means to concede. It means this, to admit to be true. All right, you think about a yield sign. You get there and, and, the, and the sign says yield. That means you're what? You're supposed to slow down and allow the other traffic, whatever direction, allow them to go first. You concede the right of way. You yield the right of way. Well, that's what we're doing when we give in to those sins and we give in to those temptations. We're yielding control. We're, yield, we're giving up control. The Bible says give, neither give place to the devil. Listen, if I know that I struggle, if I'm an alcoholic, and I know that I struggle with booze and with beer and with wine and all that stuff, then I'm not going to go hang out at the bar. You know what that is? That's giving place to the devil. That's putting myself in a situation where I'm going to blow it. So stay away from that situation. And, and we, could, we could give all kinds of illustrations. Whatever the Holy Spirit's telling you tonight, listen to God. Say yes to God tonight. But whatever it is, that's giving place. That's yielding that control. God says, listen, I've already won the victory. I've already beat the devil. I've already beat sin. You're not in bondage. You don't have to give in to that anymore. So stop yielding. Stop giving over that control. He says, yield yourselves, not, or yield not your members, as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. Members right there means this. It means a limb or a part of the body. A limb or a part of the body. You know what the body is? The eyes, that's, just, that's a member of your body. Your eyes, your ears, your mouth, your hands, your feet. You know what those are? Those are instruments. The word instrument right there means this. A utensil or a tool. A utensil or a tool. You know what this is? It's a utensil. It's a utensil. You know how many people I see that are controlled by the utensil instead of controlling the utensil? Yeah. Downtown Philadelphia. I don't remember when. Sitting at a stoplight, watching this lady. She's on her phone. She comes to the crosswalk, doesn't, doesn't look, doesn't slow down, doesn't stop, steps right out in front of a SEPTA bus that is slowing down for the stoplight. It hit her. She didn't see it coming. Down she goes. I'm, I'm sitting right here in the church van going, I can't believe that. You too. You would have thought the same thing. In this day and age, you see some, the first thing you think of is not, are they okay? It's, I should have had my phone out. <laughs> the utensils controlling. Anyway, I kid you not, she got up, still looking at her phone, and walked away. Then I was really wishing I had my phone out. I'm buying a dash cam, having that thing rolling 24-7. Listen, this is just a utensil. Thank God for technology. Thank God that there are things like this that can help us stay organized, help us stay on track, help us be on time. This thing will even help you memorize Scripture. But you know what else this thing will do? This thing could ruin your marriage. This thing could ruin your purity. This thing can ruin your mind. Listen, I'm just being honest. I, I, I'm not going to let me, I don't know when I'm, I don't know what I've decided yet, but my kids aren't getting a cell phone for a long time. One, because I don't want to pay for another one. I'll let their husband pay for it. Amen. But two, man, these things can be dangerous. Dangerous. Why? Because we let the utensil control us instead of us controlling the... You know what Paul's saying there? He's saying, yield not your members, your tools, your utensils, your instruments that God gave you. I'm just an instrument for God. 
I'm just here as I'm something that God can use for His glory, but I'm yielding it to the control of something sinful, unrighteousness. And Paul says, don't yield yourselves to those things. Uh, They do what they do. My eyes, my ears, my tongue, my hands, my feet, they do what my mind tells them. My hands don't have a mind of their own. I walked up during a handshake song, smacked Andrew in the back of the neck tonight. Walked by, he was scratching his head, and when he got done, I went, pop, right on the back of his neck. It's because I'm only 22. I'm young and immature. <laughs> did my mind did my mind think that, or did my hand think that? Right. This said, hey, this will be funny. Pow. <laughs> Now, if his mind had told his hand to do that, you know what my mind would have said? You stinking little piece of scum. I'm going to kill you after church. (laughs) Right? Come on now. I'm not the only one that thinks that way. It's funny when we do it to somebody else, but when they do it to us, man, it's not not so funny. (laughs) Keep your hands yourself, boy. Right? (laughs) But our hands, our feet, our eyes, my eyes watch what my mind says. Let's watch. My ears listen to what my mind says. Let's listen to this. My mouth says what my mind... Listen, the fool uttereth all his mind. It starts up here. A thought starts up here. And the Bible says a fool just goes... Blah, 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 blah. Just there it is. Right? We just spew it out. So I, I don't remember the exact phrase, but somebody years and years and years ago said it's better to be quiet and let people think you're smart or wise than to open your mouth and prove them wrong. Sometimes it's just better to shut up. And we're not supposed to say shut up, but sometimes that's what we need to do. Right? Zip it. Hey, this only does what this tells it to. These only go where this tells them to go. This only does, my whole body only does what this thing up here. So the reason I'm yielding, the reason sin is having a dominion over me is because I'm yielding my instruments to unrighteousness. But why am I yielding my members to unrighteousness? Right there. The battlefield is the mind. Look at verse number verse number 11. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin. Now we just read all those verses a moment ago that says we're dead. We're crucified. Spiritually speaking, my spiritual man was crucified with Christ. The day I got saved... The old man died. But Paul says, after this, the fact is, the old man is dead. It was crucified with Christ. I'm a new creature. Old things are passed away. The Bible doesn't say old things are passing away. It says they're passed away. And all things are become new, not becoming new. So when I got saved, the old man was dead. But why then does Paul say in verse number 11, likewise, Reckon ye also yourselves to be dead to sin. What's he saying there? God took care of the hard part. But I'm still thinking like that dead man. I'm still thinking like that old man. I'm still having the emotions of that old man. I'm still having the feelings of that old man. I haven't reckoned myself dead. What does the word reckon mean? It means to reason with and conclude. It means this, to suppose to be so. So when Paul says, likewise, reckon ye yourselves dead, reckon yourselves dead to sin, here's what he's saying. God already took care of the flesh and sin and bondage and all of that. So apply it to your life. Assume that it's true in your life. Well, God doesn't, I know he did it for you, and I know he did it for pastor, but he just can't do it for me. Are you that much different than pastor? Are any of us that much different than the guys out on the street? No. No. And we all look a little different, we all dress a little different, we all talk a little different, but you know what? We're all sinners. And the same grace of God that saved Pastor can save Andrew and can save John and can save everybody else in here and has saved so many of you in here. But grace doesn't just stop at salvation. It takes care of that bondage of sin. You don't have to struggle with sin. I don't have to give in to sin. So then why am I? Because I'm thinking like the dead man. 
He's dead. We all heard Brother Weedo say this, dead men don't talk. Somebody smarts off to you and you, your immediate response is, no, no, dead men don't talk. Desire you go to school and somebody says something about your mom. Oh, yeah? Well, your mom stank. And as David would say, your grandma. <laughs> that was going to be our cabin name at camp last week, was your mom stank. But I think only our kids would have known what that meant. All them Jersey kids would have been like, you making fun of my mom? <laughs> and your grandma. No. But I'm, I'm feeling good tonight, but I keep getting off track. <laughs> it's this. The battlefield is here. <laughs> Let me get back over here. I really did forget where I was going with that. Oh, somebody said something about your mom. And your initial response or reaction is, oh, yeah, well, I'm going to. But dead men don't think. Dead men don't talk. Dead men don't feel. Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. What's it take to offend you? What's it take to send you over the edge, ticked off, fly off the handle mad? Here, here's what it boils down to. What are you thinking about? What are you thinking about? Because whatever you're thinking about comes out in the rest of your instruments. Hands, eyes, mouth, ears, all of it. What are you thinking about? Where is your mind? Listen, if we spend more time, if my mind spends more time in the world than it does in the Word, who do you think I'm going to act like? Who do you think I'm going to talk like? Who do you think I want to walk like? What kind of decisions am I, am I going to make godly decisions if I spend more time in the world? We spend so much time on social media and, and, and Instagram and Facebook and all that stuff. And every, Facebook, I deleted Facebook years ago. It, gets, it, was, it was dragging me down. Just being honest with you, I couldn't handle it. Man, people get on there and they're stupid. They just are. And then I feel the need to tell them. Not in those words, like you're stupid. But I say it in words they won't understand. <laughs> All I'm saying is, what are we thinking about? The battlefield is the mind. Take your Bible and go to is it Second Corinthians chapter ten. Second Corinthians chapter ten. Just a couple more verses and we're finished. Verse number three, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Now, we've shown you this before, casting down imaginations. Where are your imaginations? Yeah. Where are they? In your mind. And every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge. Where's knowledge at? It's in your mind. Of God and bringing into captivity every thought. Where are your thoughts? in your mind, to the obedience of Christ. If you can win the battle of the mind, you can win all the other battles. Now, it's through the power of God. I'm not saying it's anything to do with you. But the battlefield is the mind. That's why Paul said in Romans chapter 12, and be not transformed, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your... What? Be, by the renewing of your what? Mind. Our thinking has to change. If the way I talk is going to change, it starts with my thinking. If the way I react to what somebody says or what someone else does is going to change, then it has to start with a change of mind. If I'm going to win the battle over a specific sin that's dominating my life, then it's got to start with a change of mind. What do I need to change about my mind? Let me show you this verse. Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4, verse number 8. I ask you again, what are you thinking about? Right now, think about your day. I mean, we sleep, most of us probably sleep anywhere from 6 to, to 9 hours. So that's 
whatever's left out of 24 that were awake. And I'm not any good at math, so you can figure that out. <laughs> Think about we're awake more than we're asleep, okay? Let's say it like that. What's going on in your mind most of those waking hours? What are you thinking about? Philippians chapter 4, verse number 8, common verse, familiar verse, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are, true. Well, she said this, and he said, and I know they're probably, the reason she said that is probably because these two were talking about it over there, and the reason they were talking about it is probably because this one said this, and this one, and we don't know any of that, yeah. right? Maybe, maybe this one did say that. But do we really know that this one had a conversation with that one and that those two got together with those two and they got together with this whole side of the auditorium and everybody at church hates me? What sort of things are true? And we, I'm just telling you, we've got to be careful. Our mind will run. I mean, it'll take one word that somebody says. It'll take one word that nobody says. And make up a whole big old story, and everybody hates everybody, and I'm moving. Then nobody said anything. Our minds are, are incredible. There, there was an old song, Excuses. You hear them every day. Now the devil, he'll supply them. If from church you stay away. The devil, something, 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 whatever. And it goes through a whole bunch of excuses that people, well, i got to go visit friends, or this one's sick, or, well, you know, uh, it's a family of six, but we got a runny nose over here, and so all 15 of us have to stay home. Really? That's what the song says. So the whole family had to stay home just to blow that poor kid's nose. That's how the song goes. An excuse after excuse. If, listen, if we're not careful, at the end of the song, that's where I was going. The one lady's not coming back to church because the preacher didn't shake his hand or her hand. <gasps> now, I'm not going to ask, but how many of you have left? Going to preacher didn't even say hi to me today. I ain't, I ain't coming back to stupid church. Maybe not that, but maybe he's left going, I ain't coming back to stupid church because John looked at me during the handshake song and didn't shake my hand. He said, hey, how are you doing? <laughs> what do you mean by that? I'm, I'm telling you, that's how my mind works. Jason walks in and just smiles, doesn't say anything. He must hate me. Well, I hate you too. <laughs> what sort of things are true? We're having a good time tonight. What sort of things are true? What sort of things are honest? What sort of things are just? What sort of things are pure? We could stop there a while. I'll just ask you this. All that stuff you're watching on TV, all the stuff we watch on TV, is it pure? Is it pure? All the movies we watch, I'm not trying to, I'm just saying, I'm just throwing it out there. All the music we listen to, all the stuff we do and say and hear and watch and listen to on social media, pure. What sort of things are pure? What sort of things are lovely? What sort of things are of good report? If there be any virtue... And if there be any praise, think on these things. The Bible says in Proverbs 23, verse number 7, As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So I ask you again tonight, what are you thinking about? Because if you're being dominated by a sin, or dominated by anything, if you're being dominated by anything, if something has control over you that should not have control over you, it goes right back to your mind. If I'm thinking about those things, and I'm spending enough time in the Word of God, the Bible says in Philippians 2.5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Context, that's talking about his humility. But you want to know what the mind of Christ is tonight? Everybody in here is holding one. Yeah. You want to think like Christ? Get in that book. Read your Bible. Listen, it's not just some fun little song we sing at Super Church. Read your Bible, pray every day, pray every day, pray every day. Read your Bible, pray every day, and you'll grow, grow, grow. And you'll grow, 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 and you'll grow, grow, grow. Read your Bible, pray every day, and you'll grow, grow, grow. That's not just some kid song. That is truth. Read your Bible, pray every day, and you'll grow, grow, grow. Don't read your Bible, forget to pray, 
And you'll struggle, 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 struggle. You know why? Because the more you get in this book, the more your mind becomes like Christ. The more you start thinking the way he thinks. And when you think the way he thinks, you talk the way he would talk. And you respond the way he would respond. And we would act the way that he would act. And so it ultimately goes back to, what am I thinking about? Is God just a thought for the first 15, 20 minutes of my day when I have my devotions? And then I'm on Twitter and Facebook and Snapchat and Instagram and whatever else is out there now. Oh, so you just got hit by a bus. Check that out. <laughs> Samaritan, that, that guy in the ditch. Hmm. Check him out. Story of the Good Samaritan, right? You know what the Levite and the priest did? Snapchat, YouTube. What are we thinking about? Heads bowed, eyes closed. I have rambled enough, joked enough. Sin shall not. Sin does not have to have dominion in your life. So if it does, is it God's fault or is it my fault? 